guys. Uh, Jake here again from Lockdown Spokes. This is the third installment of Tech Tuesday, our weekly series um, focusing on high-level mountain bike mechanics and doing things the right way. So in episode one, we talked about uh, how to buy a good shock pump for your fork. Episode two, we did a deep dive into suspension. Um, on episode three, we're going to branch out into something that is essentially suspension bike and uh, also involves the use of hydraulics and settings uh, and serviceability, and that is dropper focuses. So I have a couple of great examples here, um, but before getting into the specifics of those, uh, I'll mention a couple of things. First of all, I'm not paid to endorse the Downtime Podcast, but uh, we run an ethical business and we realize we're in a, a small uh, community-minded industry, so we're more than happy to promote uh, Chris's fantastic podcast. Um, so dropper posts, what are they? Essentially a dropper post is a suspension seat post. It is um, remote activated, commonly in place of the front uh, shift lever that will have disappeared on 1X bikes. And in most cases what happens is um, just like with your derailleur, the shift lever activates a cable, so it's mechanically activated, uh, that will then cause a hydraulic cartridge to open or close, and combined with the weight of your body and gravity, the seat post will sink, allowing you to knock your seat down for downhilling or choppy terrain, and then you get off the seat and you open that cartridge again, it will shoot back up. When it's unweighted, allowing you to have an optimal climbing geometry uh, and weight distribution, or if you're just riding on a flat surface, the same thing. Dropper posts roughly date back to, uh, I would say, turn of the second decade of the 21st century, so um, we're simply put, 2009, 2010, they started to really get a lot of focus in the industry. Um, there was the usual grumbling from the, the grizzled old timers when they came out, you know, these kids with our droppers. Um, that has since been eviscerated because it's incredibly useful uh, as a bike component. Um, this idea of, of riding gnarly terrain with a rigid high seat post um, has been recognized for the, the suicidal task that it is. And so everybody from the big OEM companies to these terrific aftermarket post makers that I'll talk about today, PNW and one up respectively, um, this technology from all of these guys has gotten a huge focus and it has been extremely well refined in the last, I'd say two to three years in particular. But I will tell you right away the dropper posts that I will use and the ones that I will not use and the ones that I will recommend to my clients and will not recommend to my clients. BMW and 1UP are fantastic, that's why they're in our video. Um, I think RockShox has finally started to do some good stuff with their newest iteration of the Reverb. Um, some of the more specialized companies like 9.8, Magura in Europe also make uh, really excellent products. Fox's transfer is, is terrific as well. Um, companies that I would not buy a dropper from, I would not run an older Reverb, which is a problematic uh, rock shocks dropper post with hydraulic activation and then post operation. I will not buy X Fusion. Sorry guys, but um, when a cartridge explodes on me during uh, checking the air pressure, even if it's just a one-off, which it probably was, um, that's uh, enough of an ordeal that I'm gonna politely pass. Uh, I will not buy Brand X or um, Trans X, which is uh, essentially a company that's owned by Chain Reaction Cycles, and they do uh, cheap OEM posts for companies like Norco. Their stuff works, uh, and it's pretty respectable for what it costs, but it's not home serviceable. Uh, you can't service that cartridge if it, if it gets air inside. You basically have to send the post back to CRC, who are good folks to deal with, but it's still a hassle, and in Canada, our riding season is so short that that's just not, uh, not in our real house. So that's what a dropper post is. That's what a dropper post does. Um, those are some of my go-to brands and brands that I just won't stake our reputation on at Hogtown Spokes. And in segment two here, I will tell you why I've chosen 1UP uh, and PNW components for this video. 
Segment two, we're going to look at the specifics of one-up and PNW components, dropper posts, what makes them so good and why I've chosen them. Um, but as a, as a quick prelude to that, I'll talk about uh, some historical issues that are, that are closely related to my selection of these companies, uh, historical issues with the mechanics of dropper posts that are really, really critical uh, to how they work and, and more importantly, how they survive the test of riding over time. The main issue that everybody complains about, rightfully so, is that uh, poor quality dropper posts, or if you get a dud from the factory, will develop squish in the saddle over time. So that's as simple as it sounds. You're riding the bicycle and your seat, uh, despite the post supposedly rocketing back up to full height, ends up squishing um, a few millimeters or even in some cases a couple centimeters once you're riding. And the reason for that is that air has um, work its way into the wrong part of the internal floating piston in the cartridge and the hydraulics uh, need to be wet, which on most posts means you need a new cartridge um, either serviced at the factory or sent to you by the factory post maker. That's not cool. Um, it happens, but it's, it's not cool. Second issue is play in the saddle. Um, anyone who would say that a post should not have any play doesn't understand how these work. Um, this bushing and bearing system, the telescoping nature of the post would not operate unless there was some space between the stanchion and the outer uh, portion of the post. It needs to be able to slide, but too much play is almost as annoying as squish in the saddle. You should not be able to rock the seat back and forth more than a degree or two. And then the third issue I will get to uh, is posts where the action either gets sticky or more likely um, you just don't get consistent return speed where you know the saddle will not return or be really slow in returning and just over time end up feeling like a very drip different dropper post than you bought. Um, all of these need to be serviced and I have left mine in an unserviced state in order to explain what that entails. But a properly serviceable post that you've taken care of um, should give you a consistent return speed over time that is uh, very similar or exactly the same as the way the, the post began. So these guys, PNW and 1UP respectively, uh, do a tremendous job at addressing all of those key issues. Uh, I have owned my one-off components internally routed 170 stroke dropper for well over a year now of hard riding and it has been close to flawless except for some very routine uh, adjustment to the cable tension at the lever which is part of owning a good dropper post and that's done at the barrel here I have had no issues with this thing there is no squish uh, there is no play beyond what was factory designed and should I run into uh, an issue with air getting into the IFP 1UP has a lovely two-year warranty and these posts are home serviceable a big technical thing with 1UP posts that they were uh, right to market like crazy when this guy first came out is that you can home shim the height of the post and that's really important because uh, if you don't have long legs like I am, like, like, like I possess, uh, and you're riding on a size large, you may not be able to get the full stroke out of 170 post because the stack height will just be too big. So, you know, one up's assembly itself is quite short. And then there's this shim that you can purchase from their, their website directly in some retailers. Uh, and basically through removing this collar here, you can cut the shim, slip it in there, and you could turn a 170 post into, let's say 146.5 millimeters, if that's the exact size you needed in order to get full extension in your frame for your body. So that's, that's pretty cool. I haven't had to use it, but I love that that aspect is there because let's say I changed my frame and I, it's unlikely, but I had a, a higher um, standover clearance on my next frame I can then make this post work even there. Or I could give this post to somebody else who's not as tall and doesn't have the same uh, leg span and they could, they could shim it to fit their, their personal needs. And it's also just a good value. This, 
this post I bought brand new uh, when it was just launched and it cost me with the lever um, roughly I think it was about $320 before taxes but keep in mind that uh, most top-end posts namely Fox will get you very close to $500 for the, um, the same quality assembly so moving over to the left here this is a brand new product that uh, we unboxed last week in a teaser video. It's a birthday present that I got for Haley. It's her very first proper dropper post. It's from P&W Com Components, which is um, a really cool company based out of the Pacific Northwest in the United States. It's run by a fellow named Aaron Curson and I believe Aaron's wife. Um, they were on Downtime Podcast and, and really did a terrific job. They do supply Chris at Downtime with a post. But I suspect, uh, like me, it's uh, not a marriage of convenience, but something that he is more than eager to do because the quality of their stuff is just so good. Like 1UP, great warranty. This is actually three years. Uh, apparently, they're, if you ever need to deal with their warranty department, um, terrific and personal to deal with. They will um, have everything you need to, at least at the factory, um, properly replace or service that cartridge in the unlikely event that air gets into the assembly. PNW probably makes the best lever available. Uh, Aaron and his team realized that there is a big aftermarket for high-end levers that improve upon the operation of the stock lever. And so this is the PNW loam lever um, that is a full aluminum assembly, the high quality proper bearing in there. Uh, very smooth, light actuation, and this wonderful bonded rubber gripper pad so that in any condition, whether your hands are just dripping sweat or you're, you're caught in a nice Quebec thunderstorm at Mont saint you still have uh, a very tactile grip. And this is basically backwards compatible with um, any of the high-end dropper posts out there. So expect to see people put this on a 1UP or on a Fox Transfer uh, or on 9.8 and so on and so forth. The final point I'll make about PNW and why I selected it for Haley is that I talked a little bit about this in the um, teaser video, but historically women riders and shorter riders have an issue fitting long stroke posts, so posts that are over, let's say over 150 mils of travel, and that's because women and shorter riders don't have the same leg span that I would have, so the standover height in order to make that stroke work um, tends to be beyond what their bodies can do. PNW has addressed that by making the overall length of this, this post pretty trim, um, and then they've also just made sure that they have uh, excellent technical drawings uh, and, and measurements on their website. I was able to nicely measure everything in advance um, to get the best idea without actually seeing the post of whether it would fit. Basically all of the, the variables that would attract me to PNW fit-wise were there and, and I pulled the trigger. Alright, so in segment three I'm going to talk about how this post actually operates and it should be really clear why a drop of post is so advantageous. Right now, I've used uh, my body weight and gravity to force the post all the way down after depressing the lever and allowing uh, oil to flow through this cartridge. And that's why I've got this nice bent knee uh, because my post is just slammed all the way down. The reason that is so critical is anyone who rides mountain bikes seriously understands that the attack position that I'm in right now, but slightly off the back of the seat, knees bent, weight centered over the bike, eyes ahead and alert. Uh, that, is the, that is the position you will be in for probably as much as 60 to 80% of trail riding. Uh, no one seriously downhills on their seat. And frankly, most people don't climb uh, without standing up. The attack position is, is where it's at. And so in that attack position with a dropper post, I can create as much as a foot of clearance underneath my groin to the seat. Uh, and on the side, I've got several inches before the 
nose of my saddle contacts my knee. And so that does two things. From a comfort perspective, it completely eliminates this scary feeling of a post ready to hit me um, and get in my way as I tackle jumps or steeply descend on, an, on, a, on a trail or an obstacle. And then from a physics point of view, that takes all of the weight of the saddle and the post from an upward, more forward position, and it positions it down and in the rear of the bicycle. So if I'm on some really steep North Shore style gnar, all that weight is on the back where it should be so that I'm not gonna go over my handlebars. Uh, that can make a dramatic difference in both your confidence and just your sheer ability to ride steep North Shore style sections or drop-offs, so on and so forth. But to clear those obstacles, let's say get to a flat stretch, put on my XC hat, if not the spandex, I realize I need to pedal. I don't want to stop, lose momentum, or blow a race, and yank my seat up, which is the old school way that the, the old timers were grumbling about back in 2006, 2007, 2008. So I'm gonna flick this lever, open that hydraulic cartridge again, and the air pressure will rocket that post right back up. And here I am in a terrific ergonomic position and efficient position for pedaling and climbing. That's huge. Down, up. You'll hear a, a noticeable thunk. Um, I'll get Haley to come and do a close-up of the post and that audio will really give you that sound. You'll hear a big thunk as it reaches full extension. Unlike rear hubs on a bicycle, and even then, there's definitely uh, a very technical reason why that sound is happening, but when dropper post thunk, it's not just some vanity sound that you can tell your buddies about. Um, we go for a, a night of beers in, in Western Burnaby. I love BC. Uh, that, that sound is a marker of a quality, fast returning post. It's also a visual, uh, excuse me, an auditory cue that your post is at full extension. It should feel that way, like you should know that your leg is able to be straight because the post is all the way up. But hearing that, it's just a little bit extra confidence on a noisy trail or you know, maybe you're really gassed and your senses are a little bit off because you're at the end of an enduro race. It's just nice to hear that. Um, and that's a, another cool thing about PNW. Granted, this is a new post, but because it's so serviceable, uh, as a professional mechanic taking care of this, that sound should be there throughout the entire life of this post, which I'm hoping will be um, a number of years to, to come, and I'm confident will be. In our fourth and final segment, I'm going to talk about how to care for a dropper post. There's a few key things. First, store your post down. The reason I do this is because on any suspension system, whether it's a fork, a rear shock, if this wasn't a hardtail, or dropper post, the stanchion is everything. It has to be handled with kit gloves, which sounds ironic because it's for trail riding, but you're very unlikely to strike a stanchion on the trail. Ironically though, you can strike a, a stanchion in the shop or in your house. Uh, and the problem with that is that if you scratch a stanchion, it can leak air. That is, that is not fear mongering, that is a fact. If you scratch a stanchion and it's not properly repaired where repairable, it will leak air because of the air pressure involved and the fact that you've compromised that thin wall. So you don't want to scratch your stanchion. My bike falls over, given that I have the post down, at least my dropper is safe. Second thing, goes along with keeping the post down. The advantages of that outweigh the disadvantages, but you just have to get in the habit of training yourself to not pick the bicycle up by the seat. There are a couple of posts where you can troubleshoot that issue. Uh, RockShox is terrific new uh, reverb with a, a essentially a, a bleeder valve at the top. Um, does allow you to fix air that gets in there if you accidentally pick it up. But most posts, what will happen if you pick the bike up with a fully knocked down post is that you will cause air to get into that IFP and it'll squish. Even though these are proper, serviceable, professionally done posts, still means a hassle, it still means time out of my riding season. So when I pick up my bicycle, I pick it up by the frame. Third thing, extension of the, of the post. 
these are two of the most reliable companies that you can buy. Um, but I'm, you know, 14 months into riding enduro style trails on my one up, and so you'll notice here I've left it permanent. I've left it uh, purposely unserviced so that I can show you the return speed being a little sluggish. Contrast that with what you just saw with Haley's post where it shot towards the sky. I posted that for the better part of the last 14 months, but recently it's gotten a little sluggish. The reason for that is because I ride a lot and everything takes some wear and tear and exposed to the elements, but it's also because I'm a professional mechanic and I take care of my bike, I wash my bike. And what that does is uh, the water and a, an appropriate gentle solvent will take essential grease, take that key moisture out of the inside of the wiper seal. And that delays the ability of the post to extend back up because there's, there's stiction in that key, that key touch interface of the suspension. How do we address that? This is a product called Fork Boost. It also works on dropper posts. It's made by a company called WPL, Whistler Performance Lubricants. This is safe to use on anybody's suspension, regardless of what you see as an official explanation. I'm telling you, you can use this stuff. The key is just to apply it properly. So what I like to say to people is, whether it's chain lube or fork boost, um, lubrication for your bicycle should be applied sparingly, but often. So I'm going to take this, because this stuff is gentle and eco-friendly, it's okay to use without gloves. And I'm just going to apply some down near the wiper seal with clean fingers on a clean stanchion. Because the point is not to lubricate the stanchion. This should be at least visually dry during use. The point is also not to pool lubricant on the wiper seal. The point is to coat the inside of the wiper seal. So now that it's on there, I'm going to go ahead and cycle the post a few times and really let that stuff work its way in. Really let it get in the inside. My post is pretty dry, so I'm actually going to add a little bit more. As with a suspension fork, inside the wiper seal there should be a factory applied uh, pure grade grease similar to a, a SRAM butter in the case of forks. That really acts as a, a permanent uh, method of coating that and lubricating that stanchion, but that is what has, has dried out a bit. And so I'm essentially just popping that up with a complementary lubricant. You'll probably need to do this a bunch of times. Done that a bunch of times. Then we're going to take our lint free clean cloth and we're going to gently wipe off the excess. I don't want to see anything on the outside because if we leave it there, it'll just collect grime and basically create this nasty, kind of sandy slush, which eventually will just sit there scratching your post, which is exactly uh, what we want to avoid in our first care tip, which is a scratched stanchion. It's normal after wiping it to still have some excess come up again because that's the wiper seals doing their job. You'll just wipe that off in due time. Let's cycle it again. is one up is not a rocket post um, there are faster brands in my experience at least with the model that I happen to get it's not a super fast post but it should be apparent that the uh, return speed is a little quicker 
and, and much more than that because this is quick enough. It goes all the way up. If this post was really in a rough, totally dried out state, even with correct cable tension and nothing going on funny inside the IFP, that post may only extend 140 or 150 mils of the full 170 stroke. And that is most likely because the seal has dried out. So we're back on track there. Um, things are feeling good. If you've done your, your service, you've done your, your wiper seal lubrication and the post still will not extend, and you're confident that you have the correct cable tension, the internal floating piston is not full of air. As with a lot of bike mechanics, sometimes it's just a simple cause. Um, so normally if I take a bike in for a proper service tune, this will be the first thing I check, but I'm framing this in the context as a final what if. So what you're gonna do is just keep it simple, stupid. Go back to what also causes a post to not extend. Uh, and often with droppers, the collar is too tight. This is a Hope C clamp collar. Um, there is a spec on that that'll say something crazy, like as high as eight NMs you can take it to. Ignore that. Um, I'm sure that the collar, which is beautifully made in England, probably can withstand that much torque. I'm not sure my frame can, and I definitely know my dropper post will not be able to smoothly operate with that much torque. A dropper post does not need to be any tighter than the stiffness necessary to support you on the bicycle. So if you stay upright and the post works smoothly, it's tight enough. Uh, if you fall and the post easily rotates, it's probably not snug enough. And for those of you like me, admittedly, uh, who like to put a torque number, granted this is not universally applicable because every bicycle and every component is a little bit different, but I would say aim for three and a half to a maximum of five NMs on aluminum or titanium or from all these steel frames. On carbon, you wanna be anywhere from I'd say three to four on your torque wrench to get that dropper operating smoothly and not cause any damage to your frame. Um, if that collar is, is tightened only the minimal amount, this telescoping action will ha happen nicely. Um, if it's tightened too much, it's like having a boa constrictor around your, your post. And that, uh, that's probably the, the final reason it's not coming all the way back up. Um, please tune in next Tuesday for our Tech Tuesday feature on shift levers and the difference uh, a really high quality one makes versus a basic one. Thanks guys.